Welcome to Wednesday Night at the Lab. I'm Dylan Brewer, a student hourly worker for the Biotech Center here on campus. Um, on behalf of the Biotechnology Center, UW Madison Division of Extension, um, Wisconsin Public Health Division, Wisconsin, Wisconsin Alumni Association, and UW Science Alliance, welcome to Wednesday Night at the Lab. We're here every Wednesday night at the Science Center. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Kenny Lee. Dr. Kenny Lee will be sharing his research on how to study these proteins in space flight and water. Before we get started, I'm going to ask Dr. Lee a couple of questions. Um, where were you born? I was born in American Fork, Utah. Okay. And where did you attend high school? Uh, in the same city, actually, so American Fork High School. Okay. Um, where did you study for your undergrad? Uh, they're not too far from home, it's a little south at Brigham Young University. Okay, and what did you study there? I studied chemistry, got my bachelor's in science there. Okay, awesome. Um, and where did you go on to um, attain higher levels of your degree? So, right after that, moved out to Indiana. I'm a little university, is where I got my PhD, um, studying under some lucky. Awesome. All right, well, everyone. Dr. Lee. All right. So, my hope that uh, with this presentation, I can help you all understand why we're interested in this in this type of research, and where we hope that it will benefit our understanding of structural biology in the future. So this is more of a proof of concept type talk. We're developing new technology, um, but hopefully we can show the motivation where this could benefit in our understanding of health science, cellular science, and so on. And I gave it this little catchy title to sort of uh, help people kind of get an idea of what we're talking about. So I'm talking about in a space-like environment, we're doing this in a vacuum system inside of a mass spectrometer. Um, but really, the, the big takeaway is that we're looking at integrating these two very different technologies, mass spectrometry and electron microscopy, to help us get a fuller picture of what these protein complexes are like. And as part of that, I want to just take a step back and advance the slide at some point. There we go. So this, this all comes down to what in science we call the central dogma of molecular biology. So very simply, start with the DNA that contains all the genetic material that encodes RNA, and then the RNA codes what uh, make proteins. And then those proteins perform the various functions in our cells, in our bodies, diseases, things like that. And so there's been a lot of previous work done in genomics, and there's a lot of interest right now in nucleic acids and so on. Uh, but proteomics is still a huge deal, trying to understand how the protein changes affect uh, disease states and what happens in our body and so on. And proteins are, are interesting because they're, uh, they, they show structure at a variety of different levels. So you have primary structure where it's just the sequence of the amino acids, and then depending on those amino acids and that sequence and that chain, they start to form uh, smaller structures like helices and folds. And then as those motifs come together, they form into a larger folded structure that we call this tertiary structure. And then beyond that, multiple of these different individual proteins can come together to form a larger complex that then start to perform various functions in the body. And these can be very dynamic. They can associate, disassociate, change conformation, and so on. And so it provides a lot of opportunity to study what's going on inside these systems. And so we're, we're primarily interested at this level, this uh, structural level where they form these giant complexes. Uh, a recent review just last year uh, also talked about how, you know, there's been a lot of work done with these static structures and understanding what they look like and, um, in, in terms of what they do inside the cell. But that only is a small part of the picture. And really what become, where it becomes more interesting is in these larger, more floppy structures, where they start to come together. And again, they're very dynamic and changing 
And this becomes a lot more difficult because all of our technologies are developed for these more static structures to kind of freeze them in place, see what they look like. But we don't have a lot of good technologies for looking at how they're changing over time and what they're doing. And so hopefully we can move into that realm where we can get into this higher complexity to really understand how all these different pieces move to create changes in, in the cellular environment. And so now I want to talk about a few of these technologies. Um, my purpose here is to hopefully give you a basic understanding of what these are if you don't have this already, so that hopefully you can understand when I get into the meat of what we're doing, you can understand how this relates to what we're doing. So one of the oldest techniques is called X-ray crystallography. Very simply, you take your proteins, you purify them, and you prepare them in such a way that they form a crystal structure. So if you can imagine like a water crystal, these little water molecules form into this nice crystal structure, and that's how you get ice. I'm trying to do a very similar thing, but with these proteins. And as you maybe can imagine with these larger structures, that isn't always uh, achievable. Um, especially if these are very floppy molecules. And beyond that, um, it, it requires a lot of preparation such that these proteins actually form into a nice crystal so that you can detect the structure in that crystal. So while this has worked for a lot of proteins, uh, it's getting to the point now where there are, are a lot of higher order structures that aren't accessible by this technique. Another really old technology is NMR spectroscopy. This, uh, basically the way that it works is you stick it inside of a magnet and you're looking at how the different atoms in the molecule influence each other in terms of their resonances. And so you can correlate different atoms and position them in space. And just a you know, fun little tidbit of information, this is actually what an NMR, uh, sorry, what, a, what an MRI machine does for you. So initially, the MRI machine was called an NMRI, a nuclear magnetic resonance imaging machine. But this was back in the days when nuclear was a scary word. So they actually removed the N and now it's just called MRI. But in science, everybody knew what they meant by nuclear. They're talking about the nucleus of the atoms. So they left it as NMR in terms of science. But there's basically the same technology. Uh, but the problem here is that this requires, again, really pure samples and higher concentrations than you do with crystallography. And because you're looking at how these, all these little different atoms interfere with each other, as you get to bigger and bigger molecules, then the complexity just becomes overwhelming and you can't actually get any useful information out of it. And there are a lot of techniques to kind of get around that, but these are still limited to smaller protein structures rather than these large complexes that we want to look at. Um, and then enters electron microscopy. And this is nice because rather than looking at these uh, crystal structures or these different resonances within the atoms, basically you're just taking a picture. And it's, it, it's, it's analogous to light microscopy in that with light microscopy, what you do is you're shining light waves at your sample and you use a bunch of lenses to amplify that image so that you can see that image. The problem is when we start going to smaller and smaller things, they're so small that they don't scatter light waves. So you can never look at a protein with a light microscope. It's just too small. The visible light range, the wavelength is too big that it won't be uh, diffracted or deflected by the protein. So you can't actually ever see it with a light microscope. But people figured out that, you know, understanding that electrons can behave like waves if you turn them into a beam, you can shoot a high energy electron beam at these samples and they'll act sort of like waves in that they'll interact with the sample and then they'll be deflected. And then instead of using glass lenses, you use magnets as lenses to then amplify the image. And then you can use um, a detector that will detect these electrons. And then you, you, you use a computer to translate it into an image on the computer. And you're basically looking directly at these proteins. You're looking at an image of these proteins. So this is really cool because now, instead of trying to correlate all these different signals to create uh, an image, we're actually creating an image directly from how these electrons interact with the sample. And in particular, the, the cryogenic version of this has become very popular now. Um, I, I put a link to that in, in uh, my introduction on the webpage if, if anybody had an interest in looking at that, um, because you're basically able to achieve near atomic resolution with this. And so you can actually 
generate an image and then create a model of, of the atoms and fit it to the, to, the, to the picture that you take and actually see where all the different atoms are. So this is becoming very popular. Uh, the other benefit with this is that you're not limited in size. It, it, it's actually the opposite. As you go to smaller and smaller things, it becomes harder and harder to take good pictures of them. Uh, so now I'm going to talk about actually what my what my background is. I, I studied mass spectrometry at Purdue, so I can talk a little bit more with a little bit more authority on this. Um, I'm a little more comfortable talking about this. Um, but the the idea with mass spectrometry, in kind of the simplest sense, is you start with a solution of your analyte of interest. You need to turn them into gas phase ions somehow. There are a lot of different techniques to do this. Um, but once you have them as ions with charges on them and liberate into the gas phase, you can put them into the vacuum environment of the mass spectrometer. You use electric fields to manipulate them and measure them. And the important thing is the only way that we figured out how to measure them is based on their mass to charge ratio. And I'll talk about that a little bit later, why that becomes kind of a, a problem in some cases with these larger proteins. Um, but the cool thing about mass spectrometry is, so we can put in this whole mixture here, and if they all have a different mass to charge ratio, we can generate a spectrum and see them all. And if we know the charge on them, then we know their mass. And so we can start to separate and, and, and weigh things basically in a, in a mixture. So we can weigh at different proteins. Uh, from there, people have figured out ways to isolate a specific one. And so if we just pick out these orange circles and then do a mass spectrum, then we would just see that signal. So we can start to uh, pick different ones and probe more deeply into them. We can do fragmentation on them to break them into smaller pieces and then weigh their individual pieces so we can start to get more structural information about them. Uh, the, the cons with this is that we're putting charge on them, and that's been debated whether or not that negatively affects the, the proteins or not, if that causes them to unfold. So that's kind of a, still a topic of debate that we hopefully showed um, why this is still appropriate in, in the data that I'm going to show. And uh, the way that we do this ionization process is called electrospray ionization. The basic gist of it is you put your sample into this glass capillary. It's actually very, very small, very narrow. You apply high voltage to it with a, you can just stick a wire into the back and apply a high voltage. And what that does is it causes droplets to essentially be ejected out to the end of the capillary. And because you're applying a high positive charge in this case, then many positive charges will go out with that droplet. And as the droplet evaporates over time, then those charges condense onto the different molecules and charge them up, and then they get sucked into the vacuum of the mass spectrometer, where you can then manipulate them, measure them, and so on. Now, the, the caveat with this is when, when you're doing this approach, you can't really control how much charge ends up on these proteins. And in, in this example, it's it's sort of a probability distribution. So here these people are showing just an example of that where you know they have this one that ended up with 30 charges on it, this one ended up with 40, these three ended up with 50. And they're not showing them, but you have all the individual charges in there between 31, 32, and so on. And again, because we're measuring mass to charge, this will create a whole bunch of different signals. So even though these are all the same mass, they create all of these different signals because they all have a different mass to charge because the charge is different. And so, whereas we would like to just have one signal for this one single protein, we now have tens of signals for this one protein. And you have to do some tricks with deconvolution to make it all appear as one peak so you can get out the mass. Um, but there are ways around this and it's, and it's actually fairly standard now in mass spectrometry to measure large proteins this way. So now I wanna talk about a couple other parts of the mass spectrometer so that hopefully you again can appreciate what we're doing and um, where this can be useful. So I talked about how we ionize them and bring them into the mass spectrometer and then talked about how we can isolate or select a species of interest. This is a, a nice little animation that I found on this um, website. You can show this device, it's called a quadrupole because there are four poles. Um, what you do is you apply opposite sine waves to the two different rod pairs. And what that does is that based on the frequency and the voltages that you apply to these rod pairs, 
you essentially create a band of stability. And so the ions with the right mass to charge that fall within that band of stability will pass on through the quadrupole and the others that don't will uh, collide with the rods or be, be ejected out the side and won't make it through. So under these conditions, the orange ones are making it through. Under these conditions, the blue ones are making it through. And then if you have a detector at the back here, when you detect that signal, then you know it corresponds to the ones that you selected. And so you can change that band so you can isolate a, a wide band if you want to, or you can isolate a narrow band. And it's very flexible technology. So this is, this is very ubiquitous in mass spectrometry because it allows us to select and then probe a specific ion of interest. Now, when we're measuring, uh, again, people have figured out many different ways to do this. This is probably the simplest, it's just time of flight. So something with either lower mass or higher charge that has a lower mass to charge ratio will move more quickly through an electric field. And if you have a detector at the back here, then this faster, lower mass to charge ratio ion will hit the detector first to generate a signal, then the slower one will generate a signal. And so basically you get this time spectrum where over time you get all these signals from the different ions. And it's very simple to correlate that back to the mass to charge. And so then you can measure the mass to charge just based on how they separate over time and hit the detector at the back to generate signals. The one that we typically do, this is actually a simplified geometry uh, of what we use, but it's essentially the same thing where ions will bounce back and forth over time. And it's a similar principle here where the smaller ones move more quickly, the large ones move more slowly. You measure their signal through this tube as they pass through it. Um, and that just creates a bunch of sine wave signals that line up on top of each other and it looks like a whole mess. But when you do a Fourier transform and bring it into the frequency domain, then you separate all of these different frequencies and the frequency now relates to the mass to charge. So the higher frequency ones are the ones that are moving faster. So that would be the smaller one. And then the lower frequencies are moving slower, so that would be the one that's bigger or higher mass to charge. But again, what I want to stress is that the important thing here is we're always looking at the mass to charge ratio. And really what we're interested in mass spectrometry, if you hadn't guessed by the name, is the mass. Right? We want to know how much these weigh, how big they are. In the early days of mass spectrometry, this wasn't a problem because they were looking at small ions that only could accommodate one charge. And so if you have a small molecule that only has one charge, then you're going to get one mass, one charge, one mass to charge ratio, one signal. There you have it, right? It's easy. But as people started asking the question, can we do this with larger and larger things? So they started finding out these larger things accommodate charges. So now this hypothetical molecule can hold 10 to 20 charges. So it's just one mass, but there are 11 different charges that it can hold. So there's 11 different m over z values. So then there's 11 different signals. Um, but again, um, if you know the math of this, each of these signals, they differ by one charge from their neighbor. So you can just set up a very simple system of equations and figure out the mass from that. The problem is when you start having multiple of these, what are called charge state distributions from different ions that are all overlapping on top of each other, then the deconvolution becomes more and more complex. And just to show you an example of that, so this is now getting into the realm of what we call native mass spectrometry, where we're trying to put these intact large complexes into the vacuum environment of the mass spectrometer, measure their mass, measure different properties of them. And so here I'm just showing this um, RNA Paul II complex. Uh, this is the full complex right here. So it generated actually a series of charge states here, but uh, what they did is they isolated a single charge. They just wanted to look at one and then they fragmented it. So they broke it up into pieces and you can see the various pieces here. So this blue and red protein are generating this charge state envelope right here. Um, then the blue one came out of it. And so generate that little envelope there and the red ones under there with that little envelope. Um, and again, some various different um, pieces that came off in different, uh, uh, different smaller pieces. So this is, this is where the power of mass spectrometry comes into play, where we can start with the full thing, get its mass, then we can start to break it into pieces and measure the masses of the different pieces. And from here, you know, you can expect, you, you would expect to say, well, the blue and the red one have a very strong binding to each other, whereas um, some of these others like to come off by themselves. And so you can start to make inferences about 
what are the different binding energies between these different components and what's important, what parts can come apart in the cell to do different functions and what parts need to stay together to perform their functions. So now uh, with all that introduction, hopefully in uh, now appreciate what we're trying to do. So we're using an approach called soft landing. And the idea is, so we again, start with a mixture of analyze, so a mixture of two different protein complexes that I'm showing here. And we need to generate them into gas phase ions somehow. We use electrospray ionization. Then we use mass spectrometry. Uh, this has kind of been coined as preparative mass spectrometry because you're using mass spectrometry to prepare a sample for further analysis. Uh, and, and just right now, we've mostly just done isolation. So we've selected this one complex out of the two. From there, you can do just normal mass spec analysis to get a spectrum. So here would be the charge state distribution. From that, we could get the mass. We could do further fragmentation if we wanted to see different pieces in it if we wanted to. Or we can take this other route where we cause it to land onto a surface. We can then remove the surface from the vacuum environment from the, from the mass spectrometer. And then we're looking at imaging it with electron microscopy. But people have done other things where they've recovered it off from the surface um done assays with it and so on or digested it to do bottom of proteomics you can do a variety of things we're just trying to teach them at this point and this is not a new idea this is something that started um actually about you know a little over 10 years ago people were trying to do this and this is one of the early examples of it so here is grow el um, this is the pipetted version of it to kind of give you an idea of what you're looking for the it's basically a little barrel. So if it lands on its top and you see a little donut right there and there and there. If it lands on its side, then you see these ones, they look more like rectangles with lines going through them. Uh, when they did electrospray ionization, not going through the mass spectrometer, they just had you know electrospray source right here and then a grid right here and they just sprayed ions onto it and then looked at it with the microscope. Then you can still see the the, the structures are there. Um, the, the imaging is a little funny and blurry. When they sent it through the mass spectrometer, again, if you look really closely, it seems like they might have stayed intact, but maybe something's going on there. And so we wanted to look into this more to see if we could reproduce their results. And when we tried it, uh, we saw things that were probably the right size and shape sort of to be this grow el protein complex, but you're obviously not seeing any donuts or you know, rectangles with lines through them, anything like that. So these particles were losing their structure somewhere. We weren't sure what was going on. You know, is it because they're flying through a vacuum environment? Is that just causing them to explode? Like maybe you would expect you know, throwing them out into space, they would just explode maybe. We're wondering about that, um, or did it have to do with the fact that we're colliding them into the surface? Is that causing them to, to deform or something like that? And what we found is that looking back even further to older papers where people were doing soft landing, but not necessarily imaging, uh, this group, they landed tobacco mosaic virus, and they showed that they could land the virus and image it, and it looked fine. So that seemed promising. They could put it on the tobacco leaf and it ate the leaf like the you know the, the normal virus would do to the leaf it's supposed to eat this tobacco leaf so it seems to be fine it hasn't lost its structure or its function uh, this other group they showed this with a, a lysozyme where uh, here i forgot to label these sorry but um, they mixed it with this molecule here and this, this, is, this is just the spectrum of this molecule. But if you put in the lysozyme, then it actually degrades this signal and causes these smaller signals to come up because those are pieces of it, which means it's active. It's actively degrading this molecule. This is the version where they landed it, pulled it out, and it still degraded the molecule to look similar to what it, what it would have done if they hadn't sent it through the mass spectrometer. So obviously, these proteins and these viruses somehow can preserve their structure flying through space-like environment. Um, and what we found out, what these people had done was they had actually landed them in a very viscous liquid. Right? They used glycerol, sugars, things like that. And 
what we believe is happening is that as they're flying through the mass spectrometer, so here, here would be a, a landing grid, we put on what we call a matrix, or just you know, some viscous liquid like glycerol. And if we land the protein complexes into this viscous liquid, then they'll essentially be protected from the vacuum environment. And so we can land a whole bunch of particles on them. They won't lose their structure and we can pull it out and stain them, and image them. And so this is just another view of how we do this. So um, you know, we use electrospray ionization to generate these proteins as gas phase ions, use a quadrupole to select which one we want, and land them onto a TEM grid, pull them out, stain them, and image them to see what they look like, what happened to them in the, in the vacuum. This is our instrument, just to, you know, cart a cartoony version of it to show you what that looks like. So all of these things up here are basically just to kind of help focus the ions so that they make it all the way through the mass spectrometer. This is the quadruple here where you can do selection. From here, um, you can either put them, well, they, they all end up here in this trap, and then you can either shoot them into this analyzer where you can get a mass spectrum or you can send them over here to do fragmentation, break it into pieces. What we did is we took out that collision cell and we put in this probe here with the landing grid on the end so that instead of sending them into that cell, we can send them directly to this grid to land them to then, then we can remove the probe and look at the uh, proteins on the grid surface. And you know, just if you're curious, this is kind of what it looks like in real life. So this is the instrument. We have a lot of, we have a lot of things pulled off because we need this access to it. Um, the back here is you can see the probe sticking out. So um, Mike, who is our um, instrumentation guy, he, he designed this or he took off this back flange and designed this flange with a probe that can go through it so that then we can stick it in, land on it, pull it out, so on. And then we have this electron microscope in the house so that we can just bring them over to the other room and uh, image them and look at them. Uh, so again, there's an image of this, just a little animation to show how this works. So if we inject ions here, they'll make it here, bring them over to the quad, select which ones we want, send them on. Here we can either generate the mass spectrum or we can land them. Uh, so again, when we initially did this without any protective matrix, um, the landed ones did not look like the pipetted one. And we decided that that protein structure was lost during this, uh, during this time when it was landed on the grid and sitting on the grid in the vacuum. So now this is what we got when we started using this, this glycerol matrix. So without any Vacuum exposure, this is what they should look like. These nice little uh, proteins with, with the definition you can see. Without the glycerol, they're all mushed or something happened to them. When we just dissolved them in glycerol and then stuck them in the vacuum, then they were protected and they look the same as without any vacuum exposure. Um, and in, in these multiple different ways, either they're dissolving them in the glycerol or just by putting them on top of the glycerol. And so then when we tried landing it, then it, it, uh, it worked the same. So now we do this with multiple proteins. So this is beta-galactosidase. It's a small little diamond-shaped protein. So this is the, what it looks like normally. You can see these little diamond shapes. When we land it without the protective matrix, then they're all kind of exploding, falling apart. When we land it in the protective matrix, you can see that diamond shape is preserved. Uh, this little cubic structure, alcohol oxidase, same thing. So this is what it should look like without the matrix, fell apart, landed in the protective matrix, they stayed fine. And then going back to grow, we have this barrel shape. And now when we landed in the matrix, and you can see the little donut shape and the barrel side right there. And then the cool thing with this is that uh, with enough high quality particles, what you can do is start to uh, create a 3D structure with them, as long as you have enough different viewpoints. And with this barrel structure, all you need is the side view and maybe a top view. And so when we did this, we were able to create this 3D reconstruction 
of the protein and it matched well with what it was expected to be. So it looked like we were preserving the structure as it flew through the mass spectrometer. Um, this is just another image of that. So this is the landed growiel. This is the pipetted growiel. You can you can see that there are a few little small differences here and there. Uh, that's that's likely attributed to this this growiel. Actually, the the top part of the barrel can kind of fold in and out like this. And so um, depending on what you catch, what what confirmation you catch it, and you might see it folded in a little more or open a little more. But essentially, they are identical. And the, the cool thing about all this was in, in the world of mass spectrometry, the people have been talking about how it's appropriate to study these proteins in the mass spectrometer in a vacuum environment, in a space-like environment with all these charges on them. And people outside of mass spectrometry kept saying that doesn't work. You know, you're putting a whole bunch of charge on them. You're sticking them in a vacuum. These things are not going to survive. Any structural information you get from this is not relevant to what, the, what, the, what they're like in solution, what they're like in the cell. And there had been a lot of indirect evidence showing, yeah, we think they are preserving their structure, but this was the first time when, or at least the, according to us, this is the first time when there was really definitive, clear evidence that these protein structures are surviving in a vacuum environment. They're going into high vacuum, flying through this space-like environment. The key was we had to land them back into a liquid so that they would survive that aspect. And then when we pulled them out, we could survive. But that whole traveling through the mass spectrometer, they're essentially flying through space. They're fine. They don't lose their structure. They don't explode. Nothing happens to them, as far as we can tell. Uh, so from here, we were just looking at different ways to improve this experiment. When we tried this with glycerol many times, we get these very interesting landing patterns. So sometimes we get big clumps of them. They're all still intact and look fine, but this is difficult for imaging because we can't pull out the individual particles and then make a 3D reconstruction with them. However, when you land without a matrix, even though the, the particles aren't preserved, what's really nice about this is that you get this good dark background against these light particles. And so there's really good contrast so you can get good imaging out of them. Whereas here, the background is really light. There's poor contrast between them and the particles. And so we don't get really good images with this all the time. And it's difficult to get a good reconstruction. And this just led us to the question, you know, let's play with different chemical compounds, see if we can find something that works better or a different process that works better. And just, you know, over, over time, this is actually a graduate student, Austin's work. He's been playing with a lot of different chemicals. So, you know, looking for things that are more viscous, have a higher boiling point, so they aren't evaporating in the mass spectrometer over time while we're landing in them. Um, also looking at trying to rinse off this matrix after the landing so that it doesn't interfere with the staining and imaging process. We think that there's some negative effects there. So we don't fully understand this process yet, but we sort of figured out some tricks to help us. And so we're still working on that currently. Um, but we did find this polymer, this really large polymer that, that works quite nicely actually. So you get a nice good distribution of particles across here. There's better contrast between the background and the particles. And uh, this is now a different protein. This is a proteasome. Um, and what, what, what was really cool about this experiment was normally you're looking for this kind of particle density when you're pipetting on. And we typically will do our landing experiments for about 10 minutes and we're usually used to not seeing a whole lot of particles, but you know, just enough to get good images. And when Austin tried this with, with this polymer, something happened and you know, this is now denser than what we get with the pipetted version. So we're starting to catch a lot more protein and this, you know, it doesn't really change anything, but it helps us to do better imaging and better reconstructions more quickly. And it's kind of exciting because initially when people were doing soft landing, they would do these experiments for hours. Sometimes they would let them run for overnight just to try and collect enough particles. And now we're showing that in 10 minutes, you can collect more than what somebody would standardly prepare with the pipetted um, conventional preparation. And you know, with, this, with these various improvements, then we started doing more reconstructions. So now we can look at the structure of beta-galactose days. And again, the landed structure and the pipetted structure look identical. This is that proteasome that I showed on the previous slide. They look identical. 
grow yell again we did in the polymer now and it, it actually looks better than uh, our, our first landing in glycerol so we're excited about this now and now we feel like we've gotten to the point where we can actually start answering interesting questions and uh, my project after this point was then to see what what can we do with the mass spectrometer to help us start asking interesting questions and so just a very simple experiment is again going back to that whole isolation idea what if we start with a mixture of protein complexes which is you're going to have in, in a real biological sample and can we select one and selectively land that one so then we can separate these out instead of landing a whole bunch of structures and trying to sort them out by imaging if we can use the mass spectrometer to select the one that we want then we can avoid the problems afterwards of trying to sort them out in the images so this is a very simple example of how that would work I just took beta galactose today's growl yell, mixed them together in, in roughly equal amounts. So you can see there are two charge state envelopes here. Beta galactose today is a smaller protein complex, so it carries fewer charges. So it'll be at a lower M over Z ratio, whereas growl yell is much larger. It can accommodate more charges and then goes up to a higher M over Z window. And they're very well separated. So all I did was I tried to cut off as much growl yell as possible even at the expense of some beta galactose today's here. So that's just what's happening here. And same with the grow EL, you know, we cut off some grow EL charge states to try and remove as much beta galactose today's from this population as much as possible. So just this is just that quadrupolar isolation. You just kind of set the window where you want to isolate. Those are the only ions that go on to then be either analyzed or landed. So these are the results. Uh, you know, and we pipetted the mixture, then you can see there's grow all there, there's some beta gal there. Without any isolation, just landing the whole thing, then we get a mixture again of the beta galactosidase and the grow EL. And so again, this in this case, it's not a problem for microscopists because the, these structures are so different that when you're picking out the particles and looking at the images, it's very easy to separate them by imaging. But you could imagine if these, if you had two structures that were both barrel shapes then it may be really hard to actually say which one is which. But if they're separated out really well in the spectrum, then you can just isolate one and send that on. And then you know that that's the one that you're imaging and you don't have any of the other. So when we isolated just beta galactose today, so that's all we saw here. There were a few growing oil particles every once in a while, but very, very few, about one, per, one to 2%. And same with the growing oil isolation. So to... I guess hopefully give you an appreciation for where this might be useful. So again, for a microscopist, this would actually be a fairly simple problem is when you start sorting them into different cortical classes. So the different light particles kind of group together in groups. These are these groupings. Then you can see very clearly there are ones that look like beta galactosidase and ones that look like rho EL. And so you can very easily just separate them out and make two different reconstructions. Um, but again, if they were to look more similar, then you might get them start mixing in together into these different classes. And you have to start playing little machine learning computational tricks to make sure that you're separating them well. And so you, you, know, you just set them into two different groupings and then you can further sort them so that you get rid of some of the bad looking particles that show up here and just get the really nice ones that then you can go on to make a reconstruction and you can compare it to previous structures that people have solved to see if it matches. Um, one interesting thing from this is that, you know, we expected it to be 50-50. When we landed, there seems to be a preference for the larger protein complex. So that's another interesting thing that we have to look into, you know, why is there some preference there? Um, but the isolations worked really well and you just had a, a few, a couple percent that um, were contaminating from the other one that we didn't want to isolate. And uh, so from the pipetted version, you can make a reconstruction landing both of them together. You know, in this case, it was really easy to do a reconstruction of both. And from the isolation, you can do a reconstruction and they all match really well. And same with the grow EL. So um, what, this, what this showed us is, is the potential that we can use match spectrometry to essentially prepare samples, either by selecting a species of interest. We're hoping now to get into the idea of, you know, maybe we can select this one species, break it apart into pieces, and then selectively land one of those pieces. So now we can look at smaller pieces of these larger complexes and get a reconstruction of those. 
you know, what, what kind of structures do those form? Or we're, we're working right now on, on an experiment where this GROWEL actually, uh, there's a smaller complex called GROWES. So GROWEL is L for large, GROWES is S for small. These large and small complex come together to form a, an assembly. And that's actually one thing that um, will help refold proteins that have fallen apart in the cell. So you need both of them to come together to form this cavity where then the protein refolds. And so we're doing an experiment right now where we have these two proteins and we can assemble them and fly them through the mass spectrometer, or we can fly one through the mass spectrometer, fly the other through the mass spectrometer, and then cause them to assemble on the surface, which means they're retaining their ability to form this complex, even though they've flown through the vacuum. So there's a lot of cool things that we're hoping to get to with this, with this technology now too. Um, now that we've shown that these proteins can retain their behavior from the cellular environment and from the solution environment, we can now study them in a more controlled environment inside the mass spectrometer. So again, just some conclusions, at least from our experiments, um, these complexes do retain their structure, uh, even though you're, you can charge them up, you can remove the solvent, the, the stabilizing solvent molecules from around them, you can fly them through a vacuum. They seem to retain themselves, at least the ones that we've looked at. Um, where we think they're losing their structures if they land on a surface without any protection. So as long as we use a protective matrix on that surface that we're landing on, then we can continue to preserve them. Um, and then this big one here is that we really want to show that using mass spectrometry coupled to electron microscopy really provides this new approach to study these complexes in a way that hasn't been approached from by, by, by before. And so we can prepare better samples. We can target specific protein complexes or target specific protein pieces. Whereas before you would just have to pipette the whole slew on there and try to sort it out. Um, so the future work that we're looking at is, you know, to what extent can we disturb these protein complexes in the mass spectrometer until they start to fall apart? And maybe that will tell us something about their stability, their energetics. And so we can start to get these biophysical um, ideas about how they behave. Um, that's similar to this collisional heating, you know, can we heat them up? And at what point do they start falling apart? At what point do they start unfolding? Um, and then we're starting to, to uh, talk to people about some uh, interesting biological questions that, that people have because they're, they're seeing the potential of this. And so they're wanting to send us samples to say, hey, can you send this to the mass spectrometer land and tell me what it did? And so we're, we're getting excited about that now too. Um, so finally, I'd just like to acknowledge my group, uh, my PI, of Professor Josh Kuhn. And then this is Mike Westfall. He's the instrumentation guy that does a lot of the hard underwork to make this stuff possible. Uh, this is Tim Grant. He's uh, at Morgridge. He's a, a newer EM professor, a microscopist professor. He's helped us a lot because uh, initially as mass spectrometrists, when we would look at these pictures that we were taking, we would get really excited about all these little spots we were seeing. We take in the image and we say, no, that's nothing, that's garbage. You know? So we, we needed an expert to tell us what we were looking at, what we needed to ignore. So that was really helpful. Um, and then this is Austin, the graduate student that I primarily work with. And he's been uh, really helpful and really good at pushing these projects forward with me. So, uh, I'd like to thank your attention and be happy to answer any questions. Okay. Yeah, I'll pull it up. Just a question to Tom. I have a question about what frequency do you operate your fiber ball and you use any modulation? So the Quadrupole operates, oh, I can't remember off the top of my head. It's in, it's in the four to 800 kilohertz range. Um, so normally they operate at about one or two megahertz, but that's primarily for 
lower M over Z applications like high through proteomics and so on. So what Thermo Fisher did for this model of the instrument is they decreased that frequency to accommodate higher M over Z things. Um, and uh, ideally, I would like to get to the point where we can modulate that down further because that will allow us to transmit even larger things, um, but we haven't got to that point yet. But we're also thinking about putting like quadruple or an ion trap on that back region before the landing probe and operating that at a really low frequency so that then we can manipulate them uh, even better. So the, just a couple of ideas there. Yeah. What are some of the other fluids, other than glycerol, that you might use to cushion the landing? You said you needed something very yeah. viscous. Yeah. So the ones that we've played with are oh, diglycerol. So it's two glycerols that are connected together. So it's even more viscous. So that worked. Um, again, polymers like PEG and PPG, those seem to work pretty well. Uh, the PEG that we had was a smaller molecule and so it evaporated pretty quickly, but I imagine with a larger PEG, it would work similarly to the PPG. Uh, Austin also tried a compound called triethanolamine and also had a pretty high boiling point. Um, he also tried a surfactant called Triton X and that one worked too. So it's those types of compounds seem to work. There are there tend to be various issues with them. So things like glycerol and diglycerol tend to cause the particles to be more sticky. And so we tend to find clumps of them. Quite sure why that is. We, we might need a surface chemist, <laughs> but um, uh, whereas the polymers tend to keep them separated more, which is interesting. Um, some of the really heavy, thick compounds like Triton X can cause imaging problems because they get in the way of we have to put a stain on afterwards to create that contrast. And so if the stain interacts really poorly with the, with the chemical matrix that we're using, then that can cause the imaging to be really poor. So the particles are just fine, but the imaging was, was terrible, so we can't see them. So there are various things to play with there. So it seems like there's kind of a balance where you want it to be viscous enough to protect the particles and not evaporate quickly, not boil away. But at the same time, you don't want it to be a problem for your imaging afterwards. And so that's where we've kind of played with rinsing techniques and so on to try and uh, remove it before staining and imaging. What are the limits to particle size that you can work with? How, how big a particle can you look at? So this, the size, so that, that's, that's the interesting thing. So mass spectrometry, currently is pushing to bigger and bigger, right? Because you need more and more power, you need more and more voltage, or again, you can go to lower frequencies, but generally you need more and more power to control larger and larger things. Whereas a microscopy is, is the opposite. As you go smaller and smaller, it becomes harder and harder to image them at, at the appropriate resolution to see any structure. So we've been playing in the sweet spot around GROWEL, which is great for mass spectrometry and great for microscopy. Um, so we're trying to push that limit. Now we're gonna try looking at an antibody at some point soon. So that will be great for mass spectrometry because it's small, but it may be so small that our imaging becomes a problem. So, um, and then the other aspect of this is that we're hoping to at some point um, adapt this to do cryoimaging. And with cryoimaging, you can get higher spatial resolution, which means you can go to smaller and smaller things and still see detail. So those are kind of the, the things that we're thinking about right now. But yeah, I would say with mass spectrometry, you can't very effectively go over um, tens of megadaltons. So we're still pretty far from that limit. And then microscopy, I would say, well, with, with, the, with the microscopy that we're doing, the negative stain microscopy, trying to go under 100 kilodaltons would be really difficult, especially for us who are novices. You know, maybe Tim could do it, but we're, we have trouble with that. So still plenty of room to play right now. <laughs> 
I haven't been able to pull up the chat because of my, oh, there it is. You see it? Yeah, now it came up. There we are. Okay. Yeah. How many people are in the room? <laughs> <laughs> Not nearly enough. Seven. <laughs> Oh yeah, so somebody making a comment about the tobacco mosaics, mosaic virus. Yeah, that was cool stuff. Okay, do you use any stains such as osmium when you put the little barrel proteins on the grid for looking at for microscopy? So the stain, the only stain that we've used is the conventional one, which is urinal acetate. Um, we played with one to four percent, but we normally stay at one percent. That seems to be fine. Um, but yeah, at some point it may be beneficial to try a different stain. Could you use could you use a small spherical plant virus in addition to the grow a yale protein in your experiments as a test of viability infectiousness, just as with the work with the rod shaped TMV virus in 1996? Yes, I think so. Um, we've tried uh, what's that virus called? It is a spherical virus, and I can't remember what it's called now, but we have tried spraying it. That one was difficult to transmit through the mass spectrometer. Um, so at some point we want to get to viruses, but those are starting to get into, as you mentioned, like that uh, higher, those, that larger range where they start to become difficult to control with the electric fields. So, but ideally we can get to that. Was the beta galactosidase still enzymatically active after soft landing? Um, I don't know. We didn't try that. So. Well, give it to and see what it does. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I sent this link to my mom. She sent me a question if I love her. So, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so those are the questions I see. So, oh, here we go. What is the current level when the 3000 volts is applied? And what is the TORS or Pascal's when the vacuum is achieved? Ooh, currents, I don't know. I'd have to look at that. So, I mean, again, so this is a modified commercial instrument. So we're, we've been depending on Thermo Fisher's um, you know, developed electronics. So we haven't really worried about those, you know, how much current's being drawn yet. Um, so I had to look at that, answer that question. But the pressure, they report in millibar, which is annoying, but I think it's roughly the same as Tor. So um, the front part is about 10 to the minus two millibar, which I think again is about 10 to the minus two Tor. And then kind of that middle region uh, where you do the isolation is starting to get into the millitor region. And then uh, when you get back into the landing region, then it's dropped down to 10 to the minus five. So we're achieving what in, in mass spectrometry is called standard high vacuum, 10 to the minus five tor. If you go into the Arbitrap, you need much higher a vacuum. So that's like 10 to the minus 10 tor to be able to get a good mass spectrum. But, we're not too worried about that since we're just focusing on the landing. And as far as we've seen, we played with the pressure a little bit during landing in terms of the changing that uh, pressure in the back. We can only change it by about a factor of 10, so either 10 to the minus four or 10 to the minus five. And neither extreme seems to really impact it that much as of yet with the ones that we've been using. So, so that, that's something that could be further investigated, how the, how the pressure affects the landing. <laughs> 